the house of the Lord because you know what we need to come expecting knowing that you know what God is going to do something in our lives he's going to give us a word uh, through his uh, the message through the, the reading of the word and you know what it's just going to be something that we can take we can just live by and we're going to see our lives change so we need to be glad when we come into the house of the Lord you know uh, this is still the beginning of the new year. I can't believe we only have uh, just uh, less than a week before it changes into February. And, uh, you know, just experiencing all now all this uh, snow. And now it's going to be really cold this week down in the negatives. So we're not looking forward to that. At least I'm not. But, you know, a lot of times during the, uh, the New Year's, people are making New Year's resolution. And I don't know if anybody here has made any uh, uh, list for the next year, your resolution, maybe goals. But I heard about the, the story about this, um, this son that called up his parents and he asked his dad on the phone, he says, Dad, what is your New Year's resolution this year? And the dad said, it's to make your mother as happy as I can be all year long. Well, then the mom got on the phone and he asked the mom the same question and the mom said, you know what, my resolution is to make sure that your dad keeps his resolution this year. So that sounds pretty good as wives. That we, uh, for our husbands, just to uh, uh, be as good as they can to us this year, amen. But anyway, you know, researchers actually have found that 60% of people will make a new resolution. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you here have done that this year, but just know that only 8% of those people actually will succeed in that throughout the year. And I was just curious what the top 10 were that this year, and actually the first three talks about just losing weight, eating healthier, exercising. Number four had to do with spending less money and saving. And we know as we got uh, through the holidays, that has everything to do with the holidays, with eating more than we usually do, with uh, spending probably more than we usually do or should because of the holidays. But number five was actually to, uh, to learn a new, new skill or a hobby. Six was to quit smoking. Seven, to read more. Eight was to find another job. Nine was to drink less alcohol, and ten was to spend more time with family and friends. It's kind of sad that, first of all, the family got down to number ten. But you know what? what's even more sadder? There's nothing about spiritual improvement or going deeper with God with any of that. And you know, what a great time through the year as we're just looking at uh, just changes in our lives that we can just stop and just take inventory of our own spiritual uh, walk and where our relationship with God is right now. You know, it's a time that, you know, we have to understand that every single aspect of our lives, that means our marriage, if you're married, your children, uh, your work, pleasures, whatever you do in life, your playtime, that, you know what, everything should include God in our lives. In fact, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, I think, is a great scripture. If you're just making goals this year for your life, spiritual goals, is to live by this scripture. And it says this, so whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Isn't that amazing? If, like, we, we as believers, that everything, every aspect of our life, that this year we're going to say that it's going to glorify God in whatever I do. Man, that will really change us. That's going to change the world if all of our Christians could just live by that. But, you know, personally, I think it's just a great goal, a spiritual goal to have this year. Now, growing up during the New Year's, one of the things that my family used to do was to watch the Tournament of Rose parades. I don't even know if they still have that on TV, do they? They do? Well, I probably should watch it now because I'm, so, I'm sure it's more beautiful now with our television technology than back when I was a kid. Uh, but... One year, actually, one of the floats uh, ran out of gas. And so the whole parade was uh, put on a stop until someone could go get a can of gas. And, but the, the amusing thing about the story is this, that this float represented the Standard Oil Company. You know, and here it is. It's this vast resources of oil. It was not prepared. And that's why, as believers, I think it's really important that we need to take time to just, just really look at our spiritual life and say, God, where are some changes that needs to take place in my life? And, uh, and just realize that sometimes we're so busy taking care of daily uh, life or the business that we have to do in our lives that we forget about the obvious. And that is the most important thing, and that is our relationship with the Lord. You know, 
we have the cross here that's behind me, and the cross is a symbol of victory for uh, us Christians, and, but it's a symbol of defeat for the enemy, praise God. But you know what? It's also a symbol of our salvation, but also for sa our relationships. And if you look at the cross, you have the long uh, vertical beam that goes up and down, and that just represents our relationship with uh, us and the Lord. And the uh, smaller beam, which is the horizontal beam, represents our relationship with others. And, you know, if we get the first one right with God, man, it's going to flow out to our relationships with others, our spouses, our, our, our friends, our children, whoever it might be, our relatives. So it's important that every year, this is a great time to rededicate, just to get refreshed in the things of the Lord, to just get, uh, just renew our spiritual life. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about a man from the Bible that needed a fresh start in life, like we all do at certain times in our lives, and that's the life of Jacob. So we're going to be ta reading uh, probably more scriptures than um, I usually do just to get the story of Jacob. Here it's a big story, so I'm not going to read all. If you really want to know about the life of, of Jacob, just get in Genesis and read about it because there's not everything I'm going to be talking about. But you know what? There was a point in his life that he needed to really have a fresh start in life. He got in some pretty family uh, mess, and so the Lord had told him, listen, Jacob, I want you to go back to Bethel. Now, so Jacob had this, his really first encounter with God at a place called, uh, that he named Bethel. After his experience with that, he said, this is going to be called Bethel, which means the house of God, which just means that's where the presence of God was. That's where, you know, he had this amazing encounter with God. And what brought this encounter was this, that Jacob was had some um, just troubles in his life. He was actually on the run from his brother Esau that wanted to actually kill him. And that's where we're going to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 25, starting with verses 29 and 34. And it says, As once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. And he said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. And that is why he was also called Edom. That just means his relative his tribe now was called that. At, from, um, and then it says, Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die. And Esau said, what good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate, he drank. And then he got up and left, and so Esau despised his birthright. We can just let's pray before we continue. Father God, we thank you for your word. We love your word. And Father God, we just pray that your word will just change us here this morning, Father God, that we can really just uh, take inventory of our spiritual life, Father God, so that we can just have uh, just a more powerful and, Father, relationship with you this year than ever before. And we praise you and we love you. Amen and amen. Well, here we see in the scripture that Esau was playing deal or no deal. I don't know if you've ever seen that on TV, but you know, it ended up he made a very bad deal. He didn't really uh, did, uh, make a good choice. He wasn't wise here. And so what happens is, is that he traded his double blessing uh, portion for a bowl of bean soup. He was the firstborn, which means he got a double blessing. Even though he was twins with Jacob, he was the first one that came out. And you know, what happens when we eat a bowl of bean soup? We know that our life will stink. And you know what? I'm just telling you, when you trade your spiritual blessings for physical pleasures and comfort, your life is going to stink. And you know what happens? Not only your life is going to stink, it's going to affect others that you are around, your spouse, your family members, you know, just other people you're around. It's going to stink up your life. So you know what? Maybe you have made some bad deals. You know, where you have traded some uh, your spiritual blessings for physical uh, pleasures. And I'm telling you what, you need to get back to Bethel this morning. You need to get back to the presence of God, the power of God back in your life. See, what happens is when we trade, what happens is, is our flesh cries out, feed me, feed me, feed me. And what happens, we trade those spiritual blessings that we have, and we feed that flesh, and then we're tr that's, that's when we trade those uh, spiritual blessings for physical pleasure. But God, you know, wants us to listen. You need to go back to Bethel. If you're here this morning, you've done it in the, this past year. Because, you know, Pastor Jordan has been talking about the last three weeks about how to get victory in our lives this year. And, you know, 
to have victories in our lives, man, we need to hold on to those spiritual blessings, and we're not going to trade them for anything. Not the, and it, sometimes those pleasures feel good at the moment. They may taste good at the moment, but I'm telling you what, they're bad for you, and they're going to have a bad effect upon your life. Now, when we look at Esau, Esau's name actually has a couple meanings. First of all, if you know the story, of, you know that uh, Esau was a very hairy person. And so uh, one of the definitions for his name is hairy. But the other one definition for Esau is rough. And maybe your life has been rough and tough because maybe you've made some bad decisions or you made bad choices last year. But you know what? You need to understand that, you know what, God is there in those hard and rough places. Even though we made bad decisions, bad choices, God's never left you or never has uh, forsaken you. And so what happened was because he traded these spiritual blessings, there was an effect upon Esau's life, just as it will have an effect upon our lives. And so on Genesis 27, verses 41 and 43, it says, And Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told that her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, Your brother Esau is pl planning to avenge himself by killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban and Haran. So here we see that because of the, this effect that had upon uh, Jacob's life, he became, I mean, Esau's life, he became so angry, he wanted to get revenge and to kill his brother. Because, you know, he made this bad choice, this deal in his life. You know, it's very interesting, and he not only was upset with uh, Jacob, he got so upset with his family, too, be, because his family did not want them to marry Cain, Canaanite women. And he's like, well, I'm just going to get back at my parents. And he went and married a Canaanite woman. You know, as pretty much what that meant is as, as believers in Christ, you know, the Bible tells us not to be unequally yoked. And so pretty much he says, well, I'm just not going to be spiritually yoked to, and I'm just going to go find someone that's not spiritually yoked to the Lord. And so that's, it just had a major effect upon his life. But then it affected Esau's life too, where now, I mean, a Jacob's life now, where Jacob's now is on the run, you know, and he's just in a really tough place in his life. In fact, it says as it has, he's on the run that he stops at a certain place called Luz. And Luz, L-U-S, it's just, uh, uh, it actually means rough, a hard place. Here he is, he stops at a hard place, named a hard place. It's so bad that he has to take a stone as a pillow. I can't even imagine sleeping on a stone. But I mean, he, He's running for his life. It pretty much says he doesn't have anything. And so what happens is God knows where Jacob is at in his hard uh, place, this tough place that he's in. And what happens is that God shows up. And, you know, no matter where you're at in life, no matter how difficult it is, you have to know that God is there with you. There's a story about this man I heard of, that one uh, evening he decided to take a hike, and it was along a cliff. Well, as it got darker, he slipped and he fell and he started falling down this cliff and he grabbed onto a branch. And he knew he couldn't climb back up because it was too steep. And because it was uh, dark, he, could, he didn't know how far it was. And so he just held on for his life and he started yelling, help, help, hoping that maybe somebody was around to hear him. Finally, he was ready to give up as he's saying, help, help. And he hears a voice saying, Jack, I hear you. And he says, well, good, he's like, uh, I need help. He says, well, I'm here with you, Jack, I can see you. And he says, well, how do you know my name? And he says, because I'm the Lord. And he says, well, Lord, what should I do? And, and the Lord says, just let go. And Jack said, is there anybody else up there? And a lot of times when we're in trouble, the Lord is right there, but we're wanting somebody else to rescue us. You know? And God's saying, you know what, let go, let me have control. But you know, God knew where Jacob was, just, uh, and he's like, listen, um, Jacob has this dream, and while he's um, having this dream, he has this amazing encounter with God, and it changes his life. Here he was a nobody, he was running for his life, and he has this encounter with God, and now God's turning his life around, and he's becoming somebody, and that's what happens when we have an encounter with the, with the, uh, the God of heaven, and so 
We, in Genesis 28, 17, we're going to see what happens here. And when he wakes up, I'm not going to, the sermon's not about the dream. It's an amazing dream. You can read about it, how he sees heavens, go, angels going up and down on staircases. But God shows up. God says, Jacob, I'm going to be with you wherever you go. I'm going to take care of you. So Jacob wakes up. And I love that the first thing he says in Genesis 28, 17, he says, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And then on 19, he says, he called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Listen, first of all, you know, when we encounter God, isn't it awesome? I don't know how many times that I've been in God's presence, and all you can say, God, you're so awesome. You're so amazing. And, you know, with, during those tough times that we face in life, we need to be like Jacob, and we need to rename our tough place. We need to say, listen, this hard place, this hard place, circumstances that I am in, I'm renaming you, and I'm going to name you Bethel, because that means, God, your presence is right here in this tough area, this tough place in my life, and you're going to be with me, you're going to take care of me in this tough place, and you're going to change my life. So we need to get good at renaming those tough places you might have this year. Then it goes on that Jacob now makes a vow to God, and he tells God in verses 20 and 22, he says, if God will be with me, I will and will watch over me on this journey I am taking I will, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that I have I will give you a tenth. So here we see that Jacob makes his vow with God after this incredible experience with God. And so what happens is, is that Jacob now continues his journey he arrives at his uncle's house, Laban's house. He sees the most beautiful woman. He falls madly in love with her at first sight, um, Rachel, which is uh, his uncle's uh, daughter. And he wants to marry her. And so his uncle says, yes, you can marry her, but you have to work for me for seven years. Jacob agrees. He says the time just passed because he was so in love with her. And then after his wedding night, he discovers that his father-in-law had tricked the trickster where he had tricked his own uh, brother, now he's been tricked. And I think he's got, now he knows what it feels like. <laughs> and so what happens is he goes back to his father-in-law and he says, I want Rachel. He, and his father-in-law says, you have to work for another seven years. And he says, okay. Um, so he marries Rachel, works another seven years. You know, he, uh, prosperity is in the home of Laban because Jacob is there. And then eventually uh, Jacob begins to prosper too. And his prosperity now starts causing jealousy in the camp, where his brother-in-law starts murmuring about his prosperity. It affects the father-in-law. And so it's now time for Jacob to leave. And so God even shows up in Genesis 31, verse 3, and he says to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So Jacob takes his family, is on the, his journey back, and along the way, he encounters his brother Esau. And he knows that in order for him to go back, that, you know, he needs to make things right with uh, Esau because he knew that uh, Esau wanted to kill him. Well, you know, the most amazing thing that happened, you know, God's the God of the impossible. He shows up, and, you know, there's uh, reconciliation, there's forgiveness that happens between the two brothers. And then going on to Genesis 33, now we're at verses 16 and 19, it says, So that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, went to Sukkoth, where he built a place for himself, made shelters for his livestock, and that is why the place is called Sukkoth. After Jacob came from Padan Aram, he arrived safely to the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within the side of the city. And for a hundred pieces of silver he bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground which he pitched his tent. So anyway, here we get to the story that Jacob had already made this vow to God. God, if you're watch over me, if you take care of me, uh, you know, I will return back to my father and my relatives that land. But then we see in verse 17, he said, but Jacob had a however. You know what? However, Jacob then went where he wanted to go. He didn't keep that vow. So many people in life have... Uh, had a tough time, a hard time in their life, they make a vow to God, and then when things get good and God turns their life around, then they just go back to the way they were living before. 
I've seen it over and over again. They say, God, if you get me out of this situation, I'll tithe to you. Father, if you get me out of this situation, man, I will get planted in church and I will serve in the church. You know what, God, if you get my kids out of this uh, uh, situation they're in, man, I will make sure they're in youth group and then they, things get better and then they get lazy and they stop. So many times people have backed out in their vows to God just like Jacob had. And what happened was, is that this place, uh, Shechem, actually I looked it up just to find what type of city it was, and it actually was a crossroad between the, uh, the major cities. So there was a lot of trading that was taking place in this. And Jacob, with all his prosperity of all, that happened with all his flocks of sheep and goats, probably in his mind he's thinking, well, this is a great place to settle down. I can do business here. I can prosper anymore. Uh, and, you know, uh, and just... Uh, Provide for my family. And then this place is also, I looked it up, and it's, uh, it had mentioned that it was just a beautiful uh, area. So I'm sure when he saw it and he could see the, he, the city and stuff, he's thinking, man, this is such a beautiful piece of, of land and, and a city to dwell in. You know, sometimes the things of the world looks good to us. You know, sometimes even we might think, you know what, the Lord tells us to, uh, we should go this way, but we go another way because we think it looks better. Maybe you, we feel like the Lord wants us to ta do, take this job, but then we get an opportunity to take another job that maybe just looks so much better and will prosper us more, and, but we don't listen to the Lord because we think, well, God, this looks so much better. You must be wrong. That's just a few examples in our lives that, that we can do. And what happens is the world looks good to us, and we put howevers in our life. However, we go the way we want to go. And God is saying this morning, if you've had however is in your life, you know it's time to stop and get back to Bethel. Get back to my presence. You know, sometimes God's words will tell us to do something as we're reading it, spending time with God, but however, we do things our own way. You know, some, however's will always stop us from advancing in our walk with the Lord because however's will just cause major problems to our spiritual life you know and it brought that to Jacob's life his however actually affected his family and so what happened is years later you know has passed and what happened is his daughter Dinah is uh, violated is raped by this uh, uh, man of the city his brothers are so upset they want to get revenge they end up uh, making a deal but they go uh, they don't do the deal, but they ended up killing this, uh, this man that raped her, and then they ended up killing all the men of the city. Well, now Jacob here is, like, afraid because now, listen, he's like, you possibly just made enemies from the other surrounding cities, and they're going to want to come and, and kill us and attack us. So now here Jacob is in another tough and rough place in his life again because if you – he didn't uh, go where God told him to go. He ended up settling in a place that looked better than what God had told him to do. And so, anyway, in Genesis 35, 1 through 4, is really the main uh, scriptures that I really want to focus on this morning, is this, that when God showed up in Jacob's hard place again, and I just want to know, let you know God's a God of mercy. You know what? Even though Jacob really didn't obey the Lord, went back on his vow, God still showed up, and it's like, you know, he still loved Jacob, he still wanted the best. So, you know, no matter how much we mess up, you know, just know that, like, it's, the Lord still wants us to get back with him. You know, he's a merciful God. But anyway, starting with Genesis 35, 1 and 4, then God said to Jacob, arise, go to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. And then let us arise and go to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress, who has been with me in the way which I have gone. See, Jacob admitted, he's like, listen, I have gone my own way. I did not go God's way. And because of that now, we've made a mess of things. I've made a mess of things, and so now we need to go back. I don't know how many of you this morning, you need to, things are happening in your life that you've gone your own way, not God's ways. And this morning is a message for you. You need to get back to Bethel. 
You know, maybe you've uh, had, you have allowed however's in your life. You need to get back to Bethel. Maybe you've lost your spiritual sensitivity last year and the years past. You know what? This is a year that you need to get back to Bethel. Maybe you've lost your moral compass. You need to get back to Bethel. And, you know, maybe you reading the Bible, praying, sharing Christ with others, maybe it doesn't thrill you like it once did. I'm telling you what, you need to get back to Bethel. You know, you're thinking if Jacob, one of the uh, Bible's patriarchs, needed to get back to Bethel, I'm telling you what, we need to get back to Bethel. And that's why it's so important that this is a great time of year that as we just uh, take inventory of our spiritual life and see, like, God, where do I need to get back with you where I have just gone my own ways? You know, because sometimes we, we will uh, just serve God in the way we want to serve God and not the way that he's told us to go. Sometimes we make a mess of our lives and we wonder why, and it's because we need to get back to Bethel. So we're going to take this first uh, scripture where, where God told Jacob to, to arise and go back to Bethel and dwell there, and we're just going to learn three lessons from this scripture that we need to apply in our lives this year that if we want to see victory in our lives. So first of all, it says, then God said to Jacob, you know what, when God speaks, we need to listen. So that's the first thing we need to learn this year, that we need to get good at listening to God. You know, Jacob could have listened to the voice of defeat and shame because he didn't do what God originally told him to do, but he didn't. And too often when we mess up and we get ourselves into these uh, difficult situations, tough places in our lives, those voices of defeat and shame is in our head. Because you know what? It wants us to stop us from getting back to Bethel, getting back in the presence of God so that he can uh, bring change into our lives. You know, we need to stop listening to those voices because those, those voices will make us feel like God is mad at us and that he doesn't want us to be in his presence, and, you know, that he's so disappointed. But you know what? God is, whatever you've done, God is telling you right now. He says, I need you to get back to Bethel, back to me back into a right standing with me. You know, listening is so important that I think, just like I said the, in the beginning of the scripture, where everything we do, we need to give glory to God this year. Luke 3, 11, 28 is another verse that I think that we need to, like, say, God, this is just a spiritual goal that I'm just really going to uh, do this year because it says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. It's just not about listening, but it's about obeying it. One of the... Uh, the meanings of the word uh, listening in uh, the Greek is not only listening, but spiritual understanding. You know what? You need to take the time and study the scripture so you can get spiritual understanding, so you can uh, obey it. Sometimes I imagine that God kind of feels like President Roosevelt did at one point in his life. You see, as he was president, he had this big smile, and he was, of course, he has to go to all these White House receptions and there was one point he just felt like people really weren't listening to him. And so he just decided to change it up that day. And what he did was he, uh, as people came and in line and they reached out his hand to shake his hand, he would say, I killed my grandmother last night. And it was amazing, he said, that people would say, oh, how lovely, or keep up the great work that you're doing. Nobody was listening to him except one foreign diplomat. And when the foreign diplomat got to him and the president said this, he says, I killed my grandmother last night. The diplomat got close to the president and, and softly said, I'm sure she deserved it. <laughs> so, and I'm sure sometimes God feels like that. He's telling us, listen, I need you to get back to Bethel. He's not telling us something new a lot of times. It's great new revelation and stuff. A lot of times it's just a tug at our heart. His spirit saying, I need you to get back to Bethel. You know, Microsoft did a, uh, did, uh, Microsoft did a survey in 2015, and, and they did the survey where they found that the human attention span has dwindled down to only 12 seconds in 2000. But by 2013, it had dwindled down to eight seconds. That is a second less than a goldfish's attention span. That's pretty sad when a goldfish has a better attention span than we do. So this year, man, you know what? We need to understand humans, we're not good at listening because we'd rather be talking ourselves. We'd rather maybe be dreaming about things. 
while someone's talking. We'd rather be doing something or we'd rather be watching something. But listening, man, that's a difficult thing for us to do because it takes focus, it takes our attention. Now, as a wife, I, under, I can tell when my husband doesn't listen to me. I'm telling him something, and of course, when I know he's not listening, I think as all wives do, we, have, we give our husband a quiz and we'll say, what did I just say? And of course, many husbands this morning can say, yeah, I've been busted that way many times before. My husband just thinks that he can be so sly and he'll start just talking and making things up and thinking, well, what was she doing? And trying to guess, and I'm thinking, no, no, that doesn't help. You were not listening. No. And I know it, it can be frustrating when people don't listen to you. It's frustrating as parents when your kids don't listen to you, and you know, because you're trying to help them. And I'm telling you, so we need to be great at listening this year. We need to make it our priority this year because if we want to see victory in 2019 in our lives, man, we got to get good at listening and heeding the voice of God in our lives. I think of young Samuel. You know, we need to be like young Samuel that I think every morning we need to wake up and say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening to me. When you think about Samuel's life, this five-year-old young little Samuel he became one of the greatest prophets in Israel history. And it was because he became great at listening to the voice of God. But like Jacob, we sometimes we stop hearing, we stop heeding the voice of God because we allow other voices to take that attention. You know, there was a, a story that uh, I heard about uh, this producer. His name was Jed Harris. And I don't know if anyone has ever seen... Um, the uh, Our Town play. And, but anyway, he produced that play and a lot of others. And he was convinced that he was losing his hearing. So he went to a specialist. And the specialist that time, he pulled out his gold watch. And he says, well, can you hear this watch ticking? And Mr. Harris said, yes, I can hear it. So then uh, the specialist walked to the, uh, the doorway. And he says, well, can you hear it ticking now? And he said, yes, I can still hear it ticking. So he went outside to the other uh, room. And he says, well, can you hear it now? And Mr. Harris really concentrated and finally said, yeah, I can't actually hear it ticking. And he said, Mr. Harris, you don't have a problem with your uh, hearing. You are just not listening. And I tell you that story because, listen, we don't have a problem with our hearing. We're just not listening or heeding the voice of God in our lives. But, you know, in Scripture, Jesus actually compares, compares our hearing to that of sheep. In John 10, 30, I mean, John 10, 3 through 5, it says, the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. So listen, the sheep hears, I mean, the sheep Jesus refers to is the true believers that they hear, they recognize, and they obey the voice of the Lord. You know, God from the beginning of time wanted to commune with humans. We see that with Adam and Eve. He communed with them. He talked with them in the garden. But then, you know, Eve listened to another voice that caused them problems. And God do, still today wants to talk to us. He talks to us through his word. You know, he even talks to our spirit. We need to get good at listening. Because a lot of times we're just listening to our own selfish desires. We're listening to other people that wants to take our time and attention away from spending time with God and being sensitive to him. And, of course, the enemy, just like Eve, wants to speak into our lives. And so, you know, Jacob unplugged his ears, you know, got down on his knees, repented. And, you know, we need to be like that this year. We need to unplug our ears. Arise. Arise just means to get up. Stop being a lazy and get back to Bethel. Get back where you have this passion for God again. Get back to reading your Bible. Get back to God being your first love again. Get back to living in purity again. And then number two is this. God, after God said to Jacob, arise, he says, then go to Bethel and dwell there. Listen, we need to dwell in the presence of God. It needs to be 24-7 thing that we do, that every day, every minute of every, I mean, every hour, every minute, every second, listen, we need how to dwell in the presence of the love, in the Lord. It's not that we take time out or we take vacations from God's presence. Too often, Christians think that it's okay that when they want to go do something, 
with maybe friends or unsaved people, they'll just take a time out from God. Well, God, you just stay here because, you know, you just won't be pleased where I'm going or what I'm doing. Well, listen, God's with you. You can't. <laughs> so listen, we need to get good. Listen, God does not want you to take vacations from him or time out. He doesn't want visitation rights every week when you come to church and then you for just put him aside and then you'll see him next week when you come to church. We need to learn how to dwell. Dwell actually means this in the Hebrew, to sit down, to settle, remain, and inhabit. You know, when we get good at really dwelling in God, that we remain in his presence, that, you know what happens? We become aware of God in our lives. We're aware of his presence to the point that I'm telling you what, it's going to keep you from sinning, from wanting you to, to disobey him. Because you know what, just like Jacob said, hey, this place is awesome. You know, I never want to leave that. And so every morning we wake up, man, just like Pastor Jordan said, oh, you know, oh, my soul, praise the Lord. Yeah, we need to tell ourselves, listen, get back to dwelling with the Lord because this is the most awesome place to be is in the presence of the Lord. And I don't want to go do or go any place without it. You know, Psalms 91 verses 1 and 2 talks about dwelling with the Lord. It says, whoever dwells in the secret place of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Listen, he who dwells, it's present tense. It didn't say he who dwelt or he that's going to dwell. He who is dwelling, listen, that's where you find rest. That's where you're going to get your protection is when you learn how to dwell with the Lord. When you get into that secret place that God has for each and every one of us and we settle down, we remain there. It's like Bethel becomes your new address. You don't have another address you're going to. And then finally, in closing, it continues on that after you dwell there, he told Jacob to make an altar there to God. Listen, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and God wants a clean house to reside in. And it talked about how, you know, Jacob told his family to, you know, they needed to change their clothes, get rid of their aisles, purify themselves. And next week's sermon is going to be about that. We're going to go in depth about what that means in our own lives, what we need to do. But you know what, Jacob, God must not have been happy with the altar that Jacob had already uh, had at, at uh, Shechem because he had built an altar there. And the problem sometimes with us as Christians, we want to build an altar based upon our own lifestyle. You know what, God, I will just give you the things that really doesn't bother me, these sins, but, you know, these other sins, you know, I really like that, so I'm not really going to to give you that at my altar. But God wants us to build an altar the way he wants to build an altar. And that altar is a place of sacrifice. You know, it doesn't say this, it goes into detail when it says that Jacob built an altar, but, you know, I'm sure it was be an altar that he had to sacrifice with blood. Well, we don't do that anymore with blood because at the altar of the cross, it was done once and for all when Jesus shed his blood for us. But, you know what? We need to, Jesus wants this living sacrifice. We're a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. You know, there, I heard this story about a little boy that asked his dad, he says, Dad, is, uh, is God dead? And the, and, the little, and the dad said, no, he's not dead. Why would you ask that? And he says, because you don't talk about him anymore. You know, we need to come to a place that, you know what, that God's not dead in our lives when, and he's alive. That you, if you got into the place where you don't talk about God, you don't talk to God, you need to get back to Bethel again. And, and so anyway, this place of sacrifice is a place that we come to God and we say, God, these are my own will. This is my own desires. These are maybe the, the, the fleshly things that I'm attracted to. God, I need you to give me your desires and your uh, will. And you know what happens on a sacrifice is that things are burnt up. You know, and when those things are burnt up, you know, what happens is the Bible says it goes up to God as a sweet-smelling aroma. And I'm sure every day God is waiting for our, that sweet-smell aroma to come to his nostrils because we've built an altar to him every single day. Say, God, I'm here. I'm sacrificing my life to you, my wills and my desires. You listen. Your servant is going to listen to you today and to obey your word. Amen? Because you know what? An altar, an altar alters us. You know, we don't say the same in an altar. And so at this time, if we can just bow our heads and close our eyes, you know, we need to get ready for our vision meeting here in a few minutes. But you know what? Let's just be sensitive to the Holy Spirit at this time because 
You know, there are some of you, you need to get back to Bethel again. You need to get back to your relationship with God once again. But there's those here today that's never had a relationship with God. And you know what? And today, if you're saying, you yeah, listen, I want to start that relationship with God for the first time, or maybe you went away and you need to come back again. And you say, you know, I want to lay my down at the life at the altar. I want God to alter my life, his Holy Spirit to alter my life. I want him to take to forgive my sins and that miracles can start happening in my life. And if that is you at the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. And I want you to know that God is, doesn't want to come into your life to wreck your life, but God wants to come into your life to make your life better, to make your life amazing and awesome. But the only way that you can have this turnaround in your life is to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you know what? He can really make your life turn around for the better. And if that's you here this morning and says, I need to give my life to the Lord, I want to, I want to have a relationship with the Lord, at the count of three, if you can just raise your hand. One, two, three. Well, maybe those are you here saying, you know what? I need to really get back to Bethel in an area of my life. You know, and at this time, we all could just stand. Because I think, instead of raising hands, I think every single one of us can find something in our lives. She's like, God, I need to get back at Bethel in this area in my life. And I'm going to pray for you. And after I pray for you, our altar ministry is coming up. We even have Pastor Jordan and um, uh, Jeremy that's here. And they just got back from um, Toronto at a conference from the Vineyard Church with that revival started years ago. And I know Jordan said this morning, he's a man, it's something imparted in me. I had Jordan pray for this morning, and I felt like, whoa, as he's praying for me. So I'm telling you what, you need to get up here in prayer this morning. If there's things going in your life, if you think, like, I just want need some extra prayer in my life. And after I pray for you, Father God, I just pray, Father God, that we will just be really serious about our relationship with you this year in 2019. God, Father, that we will be the people, God, that we really want to see victory in our lives. But in order to have victory, we know that we need to do some things in our lives. And Father God, I just pray that we will just really get good at listening to our shepherd's voice and not other voices. Father God, I pray that we will just make permanent residence, Father God, and dwell with you and your presence in our lives every day, Father God. And I just pray, God, that we will both make an altar and sacrifice to you every single day, our wills and our desires and our uh, to your wills and desires, Father God. Father, I just pray, God, that we will seriously take our relationship at another, another level that we've never taken it before, God. Father God, bring back the passion, Father God. Bring back our purity. Bring back our first love to you, Father God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. All right. So we are going to be uh, dismissing for 10 minutes. That's not very long at all. If you would like prayer, as Pastor Patty said, these guys have just returned from a great revival. The 25th anniversary of the Toronto Revival, 3,000 people were there. They received special prayer, and they are walking in a special anointing. If you want some special prayer, you've got about nine minutes to be able to receive that. And we're going to be 